Good afternoon, honors physics students. Mr. Finn again, just uh, touching base with you on Wednesday. I'm actually going to post this video for Thursday, but I'm actually recording it Wednesday, March 18, 2020. I apologize for the background uh, music. I'm on hold with my uh, person at my bank. And it's time for physics. So, what is Mr. Finn doing? I actually have here a tuning fork mounted to a kind of a bowl, wood box here. And this tuning fork is going to vibrate and send waves through this box and out the open end. So when I hit this tuning fork with the hammer, the fork vibrates back and forth at a particular frequency. Well, that's kind of cool. And then I've got another one just like it here. If I hit that one, you can actually see or hear maybe that they are vibrating at the same frequency. There's no difference between the forks. So I got a question uh, by a student, uh, Hamad, nice question, who said about the amplitude of the wave. Why does the amplitude not matter for the size of the swing of the pendulum? This is a great question. So one of the ways we can talk about it is through Thank demonstration. Uh, with these forks, so the amplitude of the fork is actually how loud the sound is. So if I hit it softer, a little, little harder, and a little harder still, none of those hits actually change the way the fork vibrates in terms of frequency. The fork vibrates at its natural frequency, no matter how hard I hit it. So if I hit this real quietly, then not much sound comes out, but still vibrates at whatever, 256 hertz, whatever that is. Now if I hit a little louder, same frequency. The amplitude, however, is much larger. So that's one way of saying it. There's another way of saying it, too which is by taking a force approach of the size of the swing of the pendulum. This is done on page 319. Okay, so you guys will remember our little pendulum from the other day. So if I have this pendulum and I swing it back and forth, it's got a certain amplitude, which is from its middle point back to its end. Well, that amplitude also happens to be it's from the potential energy at this point and matches the kinetic energy in the middle. And if you remember, we already went through a demonstration of that, which is analogous to a spring and a ball. But I'll walk through it again real fast for the pendulum. Before I do, though, let's take care of some household items today. Number one, thanks so much, everybody, for chiming in on the COVID-19 survey. I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. Certainly is a national emergency, but I was just curious whether we were taking the over or the under. And those of us who took the under, well, we were about one less than one third of the total people who surveyed. More than two thirds of people taking the over. And since the events of the last few days have unfolded, I think that might be a better bet. Anyway, we're supposed to be back in school on April 5th, so if we are, it'd be great to see you guys. If not, I do have a Google meeting time, 9 a.m. on Monday. I've actually posted this to the Google Doc. So 9 a.m. Monday for Honors Physics, I'll hold a Google Meet. So if you guys want to, it'll be also be on the uh, Google Doc there, the little link. If you want to just link into that, if there's any questions you want in real time, or you just want to chat for a little bit on Monday morning, that's the 23rd at 9 a.m. Uh, second thing. The, uh, oh, I was going to talk to you about the, uh, the um, energy approach of that wave. But before I do, let's take another look at a uh, way that you can think about amplitude and size of the wave. Okay, guys, sorry about that. So, this is the question. Does the amplitude affect the frequency? So let's take another picture of this. Here I've got the blue line here, the dotted blue line making a certain wave. 
You may remember this from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse. So the blue wave represents a certain wave going through the bridge. And there's a, a forced vibration on top of this. Let's take a look at the green dotted line. The green dotted line is where the forced vibration actually matches the natural frequency that the bridge will vibrate at. Your blue line and your dotted green line. Notice that they have the same node. If they have the same node, then they have the same frequency, as long as those constructive interference values are the same. In other words, the amplitude is big on here and equally big down here. And they're totally in phase. We'll talk about in phase a little bit later. Long story short, though, if you take this blue amplitude and this green amplitude and you add them together, you get the much, much bigger green amplitude. However, the nodes didn't change. So simply by changing the size of the wave, if it's a sound wave, making it louder, if it's a light wave, making it brighter, that doesn't change the frequency at which you would A, hear the sound, or B, see the light. The frequency would be the same. The color of the light wave doesn't change. The sound or the pitch of the fork doesn't change, but the volume changes. So that's another way of thinking about amplitude as a way of not affecting the frequency of the wave. Okay guys, I'm back. Just wanted to take you through this energy approach that also kind of uh, sums up what we're doing here. You've got this pendulum. Over here you've got a PE mass. We're taking an energy approach. We've got a KE mass at the bottom. Uh, I know we're only taking a quarter of the swing. The swing actually goes from here, out to here, and then back again. That's one cycle. So we're going to rectify that down here by the fact that we have a half in there. But you have MGH, one half MB squared, and your H is actually L minus L cosine theta. Again, this is the energy approach, not the force approach. Here's your L cosine theta. That's the distance between the top and right there. And you've got... Uh, the, the M's canceling out on both sides. So you'll get G times L minus L cosine theta. Again, that's what height is. Is equal to half V squared. And V is also defined as omega R. And what is R? Well, for this particular wave, it happens to be L. The length of the pendulum. So R equals L and omega is also 2 pi over T for any wave. So angular velocity 2 pi radians over the total time it makes to make that happen. Again, we're only taking one quarter of this wave, so you get the idea. Then that gives you L minus L cosine theta. We're going to factor out an L there and cancel it with the L squared down here because we substituted from R squared uh, L squared. So we're dividing by L squared on both sides here. L squared shows up on the bottom over here. It cancels with one of those L's in this step right here. And then you're going to have this T on the bottom with a square uh, sign around it. And then we're going to have to square root the whole thing. And then invert it. That's how T is going to get to the top, and that's how L is going to get to the top, and G is going to get the down wave. Again, very complicated because you have to continue to take the full cycle of the wave, and not just a quarter of the wave, as I've studied here. But it does tell you about how we get to some of these terms, T, G, and L. Again, the force approach, maybe more direct on page 319 to help you out with that. Hope that's okay. Okay, guys, one last piece of advice for tonight. We got these tuning forks assigned to these, uh, these cavernous tubes, and they're allowing the sound to reverberate throughout here and be then pushed out through the openings. So, as you'll remember, I'll try to focus this on the tubes here. I've got these tubes, and if I take the tubes and I just hit them both, you can kind of hear that there's nothing different about those tubes. If I stop one, the other one keeps going. If I hit this one, hit this one. You can't hear any difference between those tubes, those tuning forks. 
But let's take one that looks exactly the same. But this one, if you'll notice, has a piece of gum on the back side. And that's going to affect the natural frequency of this fork. So if I hit this one, and I hit this one, you can hear that difference as there's an overriding wave. There's an interfering wave between these two forks. Again. And my friends, what that simply is, is that's what's called a beep frequency. A beep frequency. So if you had a frequency of 280 hertz for one of the forks, and you hit the other fork and it's vibrating at about 278 hertz, then what you would get is an overriding beep frequency of about 2 hertz. In other words, the waves would be offset. So there would be an overriding wave that you could hear at about 2 hertz, or the difference between the two frequencies. Now, of course, we don't know if they're, if they're off by 2 hertz, whether the first one is a 278 or a 282. We only know there's a difference of 2 hertz. So there could be two answers if you're solving backwards. But we just know that if we can measure the up and down vibration of the overriding wave, that's called a beep frequency. And that happens when two forks or two objects that have almost the same frequency are sounded together at the same time. Difference being an overriding wave pattern or interference pattern that results. Okay? Now, hopefully, that's all get you started on, guys. There's a couple of cool things with beep frequencies. I want you to look that over if you can. I'm going to come back to you tomorrow with some better examples on some of the sound stuff. So, hopefully, that's okay. I'm going to entitle this one Beep Frequency, even though we did an amplitude study here uh, for the first few minutes. Hope you guys are okay today. Remember, Google Meet session will be Friday morning at 9 I'm sorry, Monday morning, the 23rd at 9 a.m. for a fifth hour honors physics. Have a great day, guys. We'll talk to you then.